Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Welcome to Health Oddity podcast, episode number 24. Welcome back. We've had a great start to 2021 in terms of the guests that we've had on this week is yet another fantastic, interesting guest and someone that a lot of you may have uh, encountered before. And then some of you perhaps in the strength community who've never, uh, never encountered. So this is going to be an opportunity for you to see the other side of the health equation, the endurance world. But also we're going to discuss a variety of uh, things from nutrition, strength training, endurance, you name it, but let me, we'll get on to that in a second. For the moment, I just want to welcome my guests today, uh, my uh, my colleagues rather, my co-hosts, Peter Lant. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? Ah, I'm all right. I've got. A, I was going to try and do all that in a rhythmical thing, like Brad does on his podcast, but I don't think <laughs> I'll be able to pull it off. <laughs> don't, don't rap. Don't rap. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Brad can do it. Brad has a rhythm. Well, Peter's kind of- doing all right. He's staying up at night for the man on the West Coast. He got the most. It's a fantastic show. Hope you stick around. Yo. Hey. You see, <laughs> you see Brad, the last, I'm from Newcastle, right? We are Geordies. And the last Geordies who did raps were called Ant and Deck. Don't look them up. It was dreadful. <laughs> anyway, back to you, Paul. <laughs> okay. So, James, you've got to follow that now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the excuse that the kids are in bed, so I've got to keep the noise to a minimum. <laughs> right, okay, okay, we'll take that, okay. So um, Brad's already kind of introduced himself. Brad Kearns is our guest today. Brad is um, not only a podcaster, he's an author, he is a athlete. I mean, the list goes on. I'm just going to reel off some things that Brad's done. I came across Brad many a few years back uh, because I love listening to podcasts myself and there's so many great podcasts out there. And I came across Brad on the primal endurance podcast that he'd done with, uh, Mark Sissons. Some of you may know Mark Sissons who runs his blog, Mark's daily apple, but Brad, uh, Brad has a way with words. Brad has a way of making very complex ideas, really palatable and really interesting and a way of opening your mind to complex ideas, but also giving you advice without making you think that you've done everything wrong in your life but actually there's opportunity out there and you could do things a little bit better so for me it was always a pleasure listening to his podcast uh welcome brad i'm going to do a little introduction but say hey thanks paul (laughs) yeah so uh brad comes from a background of endurance so those of you who who listen to this podcast who perhaps know us because you're in the strength community then you'll get maybe not be familiar with much of the strength uh, the endurance world but uh, we also have listeners from all backgrounds. Our clients are from the ages of 35 to 65, a general population who just wants to get healthy. And Brad's podcast, Be Rad, and also the stuff he's done in the past called the Primary Endurance Podcast, address health in such an interesting way and from a different perspective that you may have heard. So Brad's background, where do I start? I mean, Brad is an author. He's written books, best-selling books. Brad previously was a triathlete a world renowned triathlete. Uh, was it top three? If I've got a top 20 ranked professional speed golfer, top, uh, top three world ranked masters, 55 to 59 high jumper. Uh, you broke the Guinness world, Re- Guinness world record for the fastest single hole of golf ever played. Uh, speed golf, uh, we've got to get onto that at some point. Um, and uh, where have we got the, uh, your, your triathlon work? You'll have to tell us about that because I can't find it on here. My, um, but Brad was a world-renowned triathlete, uh, posting some crazy times, and and now he works to educate the general health seeker on endurance, well-being, nutrition, and has some really interesting ideas. So welcome, Brad. Well said. Thanks for the intro, Paul. Yes, yeah. I was I was an old-time triathlete. I was not as fast as the Brownleys are today. And I marvel at how the sport has progressed from the early days because I was really involved in the very, very early uh, beginning of professionalism in triathlon. We weren't in the Olympics yet. We uh, eventually got there in the year 2000, uh, long after I retired from the sport. So I raced in the 80s and 90s. And 
boy, it was about going out there and doing these three grueling endurance sports, swimming, biking, and running, and just putting as many hours of training in as you could squeeze in during the day and wake up and try to do it the next day. So it was very rudimentary. And uh, of course, you know, things have progressed in, in all manner of sport uh, to present day where these guys are, you know, just exceptional uh, world level performers in the case of the Brownleys in, in individual sports that they're competing in and putting together as triathletes. So um, that was a long time ago and a whole different, you know, uh, phase of my life. And since I retired, when I was age 30, I was done with professional racing. I raced from 20 to 30 and I was completely worn out and wiped out from all the traveling and the extreme training. And so then I had to open my eyes to, um, okay, what's the rest of my life going to look like and how am I going to maintain fitness? But not only maintain fitness, um, and you were reading those crazy things off the bio, the Guinness World Record for speed golf, who's heard of that, you know, or the, the high jumping that I do in the, in the old guys 55 to 59 division, but I feel it's really, really important uh, to move through life and always maintain that passion and that competitive intensity. So I'm no longer a professional athlete who wakes up and, and lives and breathes my sport and has my, the, the pressure of you know, making my income from what position I finish in the race and all that kind of stuff is a phase that's gone now, but I still have that edge where I'm really serious about my goals, even though they're silly and might not matter and they might not be on ESPN and I might not be getting large size checks at the award ceremony if I, if I happen to do well, but they mean just as much to me when I sneak into an empty high school stadium and go and practice my high jumping and put the bar up and, and clear the bar and I scream in the pit even when there's no one around, it feels the same to me as winning a race on the pro circuit with the, the crowds and the cameras. And so I really like to promote that message. I know um, a lot of your listeners are in those age groups where they're done with their uh, their, their schoolboy athletic experiences or their, that extreme level when they really reach the highest point. And then you see a lot of people that are sitting around and watching television and talking about how, how fast or how strong they were back in the day. So I'm, I'm putting the, um, you know, the challenge out to everyone that find something that lights you up, that really makes you happy and is a really compelling goal. It doesn't mean you have to spend six hours per day training for it like I like did back when, but it's just doing the approach that gives you excitement and then something to keep you focused and keep doing my drills and my injury preventions and my mobility exercises and all that kind of stuff that maybe we'll talk about a little bit, but I want to be known as that lifelong athlete and, and whatever I'm doing, that's what's, that's what's important to me. Fantastic. One I mean, things, um, I was just going to say Paul McElroy, who we had on last week. Um, one of the things he said, if you want to get good at something and if you really want to improve, then compete in it, you know, and, mm. and that element of, of lifelong competition and no matter what level you're competing at or who you're competing against that element of actually having to step up and take part in some form of competition really focuses the mind, doesn't it? It focuses the training and just focuses the whole approach to life, I think. Yeah, well said. And I think we can so easily uh, sink into an extremely comfortable life uh, for the first time in the history of humanity. You know, right now uh, we, we're struggling. We have the global epidemic uh, and all those things. There's always something to complain about. But in, in a general sense, you know, many people, most people listening, uh, you can make it through life pretty easily, not having to lift anything heavy, um, maybe getting a secure income and so that your future is assured where you just show up and, uh, you know, log into your computer, uh, make your contribution to the economy and, and go home and watch, uh, you know, watch the television. So I think we do have to get awakened to um, the, the challenges of, of being of what makes us human. That's why I like this uh, cold plunge that I've uh, promoted. And you can look at me on YouTube, Brad Kern's chest freezer cold plunge. What's that guy doing? He's jumping into a chest freezer filled with water that's 36 degrees. And I do that as part of my morning regimen. And it, it feels uh, cold. I'm not saying it's wonderful. The, the, uh, the spa tub that I have nearby that's 104 feels wonderful every time I go in. But the reason I do this is because I want to build that focus and that resiliency against all forms of stress and the cold water is representative of, you know, if I can do that and I can discipline my body to get in that tub 
and, and go through my 20 breath cycles, which takes about five minutes and I get out. If I can say that I do that and tell all your listeners, um, it, it means something to me that I'm a focused, disciplined guy. Not that I don't uh, like to relax and, and goof off and, and whatever, but we got to have something in our life that's keeping us, helping us keep that edge. And that has a lot of uh, implications for hormone balance as well. Absolutely. I mean, you, you, live in, you live in Los Angeles, right? So you need to get Lake a Lake Tahoe, I live in now. Oh, Lake Tahoe, sorry. I thought, yeah. you, I thought you lived... Oh, you're from Los Angeles, right? Is that yeah, right? originally, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but anyway, it's, it's warm over there, isn't it? Lake Tahoe is a, a mountain resort, so it's a skiing area. Skiing, right, it's okay. very cold. Oh, Los right. Angeles is nice and warm. So Sorry, yeah. I thought you were in LA because I was like, yeah, you're going to need to do a cold plunge there here. We don't really have that problem in the winter. We're, we're all right with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for that point, because, uh, you know, it's Mark Sisson and I were writing about this and we're thinking, wait a second, you know, Mark's in Miami now and I'm in, you know, I was in Sacramento, which is a temperate climate. And if you're heading out into a cold day, uh, installing snow chains for the motorists or working in an unheated warehouse, the, the cold therapy is going to take a different look, but you're right. For most people, um, it's, it's, you know, a nice way to start the day. And then you can rewarm naturally, let's say in your home wearing, sometimes I have to wear a sweatshirt and a hoodie uh, because I'm getting a little, it's called uh, after drop where you, your body temperature is low and you start to shiver a little bit, but it's, it's a great therapy for uh, most everyone who's heading into a warm environment for the rest of the day. And that's one of the things that we've missed in modern life is this adaptability to temperature extremes, because wherever we are on the globe, most of our time is in a comfortable setting. Even if we're in above the Arctic Circle in Northern Sweden, they still got the fire going and it's 71 inside the home. Uh, same with the UK, it doesn't have the greatest uh, winter weather, but I don't see a lot of people out there uh, in shorts and a t-shirt uh, spending hours outdoors. So um, it's, you know, it's nice to bring in these, they're called hormetic stressors, these brief positive natural stressors and a strength training session is the same. It's the same category, same with fasting, uh, sprinting, lifting some heavy stuff, jumping in the cold tub. These are all things that hone our resiliency to stress. I, remember I was about to say, James, you, that, that hot tub you have out the back, uh, we like to do some of the things we discuss on the, uh, on the podcast. So I nominate you to use that, uh, use that in the winter without warming it up. <laughs> well, a few years ago, I, I've heard you, um, I've heard you, Brad, talk about Wim Hof and things in the past. And a few years ago, I, I started doing the cold showers and just, you know, started doing the cold shower, the cold at the end of the shower and then the whole cold showers. And I really got into it. And then one, one time I was over in, in the French Alps skiing in the, uh, obviously in the winter. And I turned my, my shower there fully round to cold. And it was a different degree of cold than I have in my, uh -huh. in my shower at home. It was I. It was ice. It was. It was. It was. You know. It was unbearable almost. It was so so much colder than the coldest I can get the water here. So uh, yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, I think you've got to do it in in increments. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I mean uh, um, about the endurance world, particularly, is that. Uh, and particularly triathlons, Ironman, stuff like that, they take a certain mindset. And often that mindset mm -hmm. is quite a determined one. Uh, sometimes you get very A-type characters. When you look at it on paper, an Ironman, for example, is a ridiculously long distance. You know, a lot of strength athletes, you know, they think in sets of five and sets of three. You know, we're thinking of hours upon hours on your feet on a bike, swimming through water, uh, swimming through the sea, uh, and, and that's quite an extreme thing. And often people see that the solution to get to that point in which they can complete it needs to be equally as extreme. And it's not to say that it shouldn't be hard, but I hear you talk about a different side to that and a more sustainable one, because you really built the plane while you were flying it back in the days when you were at, at your elite level, uh, because it was still a young sport. So what's changed in triathlon? Do you think it's changed? And, and how has that shaped your current thinking about how uh, someone who's in their 40s, for example, should train? Hmm. Good question. I think, unfortunately, not enough has changed for my liking. And even at the highest level of professional sport, I know the, the big sports are uh, you know, soccer and track and field and in Europe and in, in 
uh, America, we have the, the, the basketball and the football and the baseball leagues. And you see these players uh, getting routinely injured and cast aside and their careers are shorter than they should be. Um, the great basketball player, Clay Thompson, had a horrible injury. He missed a season and then he was getting ready for the next season and he tore his Achilles for another uh, missing season. And so I contend that something is still uh, disastrously uh, flawed with even the way we train the highest level uh, elite athletes in sport. I know there's going to be a risk when you're trying to break world records that you might pull a hamstring at one point if you're training that hard. Uh, but I think there's a tendency, just like you described that personality, you were very polite when you described that, uh, that uh, yeah. highly motivated uh, type that's attracted to these crazy sports. But yeah, if we, if we step into the, uh, the question, knowing that we're dealing with a certain population that's really willing to do whatever it takes to succeed and is driven and focused and is not needing motivation to get off the couch, it's more likely that they need motivation to uh, adhere to a recommended strategy that includes backing off and taking it easy and not going out there and blasting oneself every time we go out the door. Uh, and I think we can all nod our heads and say, yeah, that, that sounds sensible, what Brad's saying or what this says in the book here. Uh, but I think we really have to come to terms with uh, the purpose that we're, we're, we're intending when we go and do a workout. And for example, um, if you're uh, needing to blow off steam from your stressful pent up lifestyle with uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, job stresses and your boss is difficult or your family's on your case and you want to go out there and throw some weight around, that's perfectly acceptable. And it's a great expression of your humanity to go out there and, and push yourself and become uncomfortable. Uh, but then we have to weigh that with, let's say we've set some goals and we've written down on paper that we want to uh, excel in a certain sport or in whatever um, you know benchmarks we have, that requires a proper balance of stress and rest. And so I, I like just listening to uh, the intuition, not, not so much listening to the body and going by instinct, because that's like an animal instinct. You know, the animal will run until they drop because they're chasing a rabbit and that's their instinct. Uh, humans have the ability to have a higher level of reasoning. So you might feel great. Uh, every day for six days in a row because you're in a competitive setting and training with some uh, really in, in an exciting environment with the loud music when you go in and do the biking class. But you have to say, look, um, I've also uh, been working really hard and I have all these other stress factors in my life. And it's a sensible idea now to tone things down for a while, uh, even as my, you know, my, my legs feel okay, but I, I notice they're, you know, getting a little bit uh, achy or, or whatever, and sort of, you know, preempt these, these, uh, these problems where we dig a hole and it takes a long time to crawl out. And you can always look back and go, yeah, I got a bit of a cold there because uh, I stayed up late at the party. I ate a lot of sugar and I did a huge uh, workout the following day and then uh, didn't usually take my restful afternoon. I had to go and do something else. And then boom, you're down for two weeks of subpar immune function and bad energy and all these things. And so um, that part you you get a little uh, tricky and nuanced because people want so badly to achieve something and write in their journal that they they just uh, rode their bicycle for 80 kilometers or you know ran for an hour and felt great and had a faster time over the over the course of the park loop than they did before and so it's like sort of delaying this instant gratification to being more patient and having a bigger picture of what it means to be fit and healthy and how those two don't necessarily go together and in fact can be in opposition unless you're smart about it. Exactly. I've just had that exact example um, before before we, we did this podcast, actually. I had a guy online this evening, so we have to train online at the moment because all the gyms are shut. Mm. Um, and he'd been at work all day, so he works in one of the big supermarkets. He's, he's like a manager of one of the big supermarkets over here. And they've been really busy during the lockdown because they're one of the only shops that are open. So they're just super busy. So he's been really stressed. And then he got, he gets, he, he drives home and within 10 minutes of getting home, he's on the call with me to do a session. So the first thing I ask everyone before we even start is how are you feeling? Are you feeling strong today? Are you feeling fit? Are you feeling mobile? Are you fit? You know, and we can test that out in the first couple of, couple of minutes. And he was like, I'm knackered. My back sore. It was killing me in the car on the way home. I'm really tired. So it was like, right. I had an idea of what we were going to do, but I was like, we're not doing that. 
and we just did a load of mobility work, like your morning, morning routine type stuff, you know, just like, like a little bit of static stretching, a little bit of mobility, a little bit of movement. And then it was like, at the end of that, how does your back feel at the end of that exercise? Much better. Right. Now try this. How does it feel doing that? A bit sore. Right. Let's do something else. Then go back to that. How does that feel now? Oh, it's better. And he said, and I inst- try to instill this in all of my, all of the people who come to see me is like, it doesn't matter what you feel like, come along anyway, because we'll mm. be able to do something. Because if you mm-hmm. don't come along, you're going to sit on the sofa, watch telly, probably get a rubbish night's sleep. And then, you know, and then tomorrow's a write off as well. So at least we can try and get at something done, which is why I love, I only watched it yesterday, actually, your morning routine video. And I thought that was brilliant. Um, it was very quick. <laughs> <'Cause we're not laughs> but no, I thought that was brilliant. And it's like, I mean, obviously yours is like 35 minutes long, I think you said. But, you know, people don't have to do that. But I, I often try to get people to just do five minutes in the morning because you watch, you know, I watch my dog in the morning. He gets up and he just, he, he stretches out, downward dog, and then he does it this mm. way. And then he's like, oh, and then he's like, right, I'm ready to go now. You know, and humans don't do that. We'll get up, have a shower, get in the car, go to work. And it's... It's well, a, now they just get, it's, they, they get up, they have a shower, <laughs> they get their bowl and then they work and they eat and work. I mean, I've got clients, they, they wake up 10 minutes before they're, set, they're sending emails. It's crazy, particularly this work-life balance we have now in the, in the post lockdown yeah. world. Yeah, well, that's another type of mentality, isn't it, as well, of like, oh, I'm at home now, so I don't have the commute, so I can get up later. It's like, no, you can get up at the same time and do lots of other stuff first before work. And you'll you'll realize you'll reap the benefits. Um, yeah. So, so one of the things that I want to talk about is, and this kind of segues into something we were talking about right at the beginning. Um, of, often we have a disconnect between what was done, what would an individual achieve, say in their twenties, maybe particularly in America, where it's very competitive, high school and university uh, sports leagues across all disciplines. Then there's twenty years of work where people sit at a desk, people, uh, you know, start to go into disrepair, they become more chair shaped. And then all of a sudden at 40, look, I'm 40. Sometimes I think that I pretty much, am I having a midlife car crisis or is it about to happen? I don't know. I can't quite work out if I'm actually in the middle of one or it's about to start, but you suddenly go, right, I'm going to do something big. I'm going to run an Ironman. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do an ultra marathon. I'm going to deadlift. 150 kilos first time ever whatever it is and um, they forget that period in between so when I mean when you talk to people Brad how are you kind of addressing that kind of that that zone that that they (laughs) seem to forget about between I used to do this and now what can I do yeah it will I think a lot of people are in that all or nothing mentality and there's probably a huge level of burnout from you know, once you finally move past your sporting glory times where it was such a all consuming exercise, I don't, I don't really have any interest in doing triathlon related training anymore because I did it for nine years straight every day. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm on to, uh, things that interest me more. And I think there's some way to bridge that gap is to say, look, it doesn't, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be a, a, you know, all in member of the national team type of mode here. You can just get out and enjoy your neighborhood and uh, do things that challenge your body and that aren't that strenuous. And, um, you know, it was a good point, Peter, you, you got to get the person out and doing something, but I think we're, you know, we're even I'm guilty of saying, well, if I don't feel perfect, I'm just going to skip it today rather than doing a 25% session or a 50% session. And the more you can kind of bank those really easy baseline exercise sessions, you're going to get massively fitter. And that's, I guess, the secret that a lot of people don't understand, that if you can just walk, uh, you're getting a cardiovascular workout. If you have a goal of completing the, the London Marathon or the London to Brighton or whatever big goal you have, uh, walking around the block for 30 minutes is a huge benefit to your cardiovascular conditioning. And it, it raises the platform from which you launch the formal training sessions where you are going to go out on the weekend and try to extend your distance of your longest run or whatever. And same for the strength training scene where if your routine is that you go to the gym three days a week and you 
bust it with a personal trainer for an hour or the Zoom uh, personal training session, and then you don't lift up anything the rest of the week except a laptop, um, that's not going to predict success as well as someone who has a little bit of, uh, I call them micro workouts that are sprinkled into the mix where every morning you do a set of 20 deep squats. So you're engaging your glutes and your, uh, your quads and you're, you're building that muscle tone so that when you go in the gym and do some deadlifts, you're going to feel a little bit better because you spent uh, four minutes every morning uh, engaging those same muscles. And you can kind of add up, you mentioned my morning routine, which started out really, really simple and easy. And now it's a pretty badass workout. If I have to say, like I do it every single day, I'm committed to it. And so I very, very carefully upgraded the degree of difficulty and the time duration because I wanted to make sure I could handle it and I wouldn't be averse to it no matter what. And so for me, this has worked really well. But when you start with a five minute session and you can commit to something that's that simple, or in the case of micro workouts, I have some examples that I've written about and I have some videos up. I think you can look on YouTube, Brad Kern's micro workout suggestions or something. But uh, for example, I have a pull-up bar in my closet. And so my rule is anytime I go into the closet to get more post-it notes, because I would have a supply cupboard in there or to get a garment, I have to do one set. It's not like a big deal. Even if I did a nice workout that morning or I have a big workout coming tomorrow, one set's not going to bother me or, or anyone else. I don't have to write it in my training journal. But if that's my rule and I can do, let's say, 365 days later, we're talking about this and I've done, hmm, 200 sets of pull-ups just from the closet door rule or lifting uh, a single set of hex bar deadlifts every time I throw the garbage away from the kitchen because it happens to be on the way to the garbage bin outside. Um, I'm lifting hundreds of thousands of extra pounds in the course of a year that is gonna help my training so much without bringing in any of those risk factors from overtraining, injury, soreness when you, you, know, you push it too hard in the gym. So it's, it's getting out of that all or nothing mentality where a workout is this beautiful work of art where you've put up wonderful numbers. And I know the CrossFit people, you know, have their times on the whiteboard and they want to beat the previous time. Otherwise they might as well go home. And that kind of mentality uh, can, can really be adjusted gracefully to think of yourself as just living a fit lifestyle, which happens to include those big trips to the gym for the formal session, but it also happens to include the fun stuff. So with, with one of the big challenges, particularly when I was running with other people, and I, and I see it actually in the gym, if you go in this group of people, is, is how do you do your own training whilst being in a community? Because often, you know, especially in the triathlon community and things like that, you've got to keep up with someone who's zooming ahead. And I mean, in weight training, you can take the weights off, but often someone's, oh, let's do another set. Let's do another set. Let's do biceps now. Let's go for some sprints. And it's quite easy to get into that kind of competitive mm -hmm. mode unknowingly, even if it's just a couple of extra, extra sets. So how do you get around that? Well, it is really nice to have that extra source of motivation from the group energy. And those are wonderful experiences, especially when I was a triathlete, I was training mostly by myself. And then when it was time to join up with the gang, uh, you could count on having a great workout and pushing yourself to new heights. But that happens, you know, I, I respected those sessions very much so. And so that I knew on Tuesday morning, we weren't going to mess around when six guys were meeting us at the trail. And so that means that on Saturday and on Sunday and on Monday, when I was out there jogging by myself, uh, you can bet I wasn't going to be uh, pushing or challenging myself in any way. I was thinking of, you know, those that forthcoming special occasion. And anyone can, you know, treat their training uh, program in the same manner. So if you do have a session with your trainer every Wednesday, um, you know that on Monday, Tuesday, you're just going to do those warm up drills that the trainer gave you, and you're going to, you know, keep the blood flowing, but you're not going to crush yourself and then show up into a gym where you are going to be challenged. So that's that's one thing that that comes to mind right away. And then the other one is like you got to have a big picture and understand the purpose for every single workout that you're conducting, and that will be really helpful versus just kind of a haphazard approach where um, you're, you know, going, you're, you're, you're responding to the person that passes you on the bike path, because you don't like to get passed by someone wearing sneakers, and you have clip in cycling shoes, so you're going to catch them and chase them down. And believe me, there's some fast guys wearing sneakers on the bike path, you don't want any part of that when you're on a recovery day. <laughs> Brad, can I, can I, uh, maybe a good time now to kind of touch on um, the actual, uh, 
kind of the mafetone, the heart rate training and that sort of thing. I was going to ask when you were doing your sort of triathlon work in maybe like the 80s and the 90s, were you were you monitoring heart rate at all back then? Yeah, I got my first heart rate monitor in 1987 made by Polar. It was the first wireless heart rate monitor available and the wristwatch was a, a perfect square. And so we joked that it was like a miniature toaster on your arm and it was, it was quite large. It was bigger than my wrist. So it, it kind of stuck out, but that was really cutting edge. And luckily I met some guys that were, uh, you know, at that cutting edge and introduced me to heart rate training, Johnny G, the founder of spinning and uh, a fitness legend in America. Um, he, he, you know, he got into that when, when no one else knew what was going on. And so um, monitoring the heart rate was a huge deal because we now know from uh, great science and, and mafetone has been talking about this for decades, Dr. Phil Maffetone and his books, and people didn't listen for quite a while. And now he's getting more and more prominent, I think, and the message is being really well embraced across all fitness levels, all ability levels from elites down to beginners. Uh, but the concept is that when you're doing a cardiovascular workout, um, there's a cutoff point where you're doing a mostly fat burning workout that's energizing and you know doesn't doesn't have a lot of uh, stress, and then you cross over as you get fast, go faster and faster into a uh, predominantly glucose burning workout that is more stressful, uh, more trauma traumatic for the muscles, takes longer recovery time, and if you kind of uh, trend toward a workout that's slightly too stressful, and you do that over and over, you're going to end up in the wonderful destination of burnout. And this is kind of the story for most people exercising in the group exercise world in the gyms, most people out there on the roads training across the world for the 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, ultra marathons. They're just taking that heart rate a little bit too high because you're still feeling very comfortable. You're not in a race setting where you're breathing hard and you're up at the anaerobic threshold heart rates. A lot of listeners I'm sure are familiar with, uh, that's the, you know, the red line where you're right at the edge of what you can sustain for an hour if you were doing an all out race. Uh, but the aerobic maximum heart rate is quite comfortable. And you can't really discern this uh, very well uh, subjectively. That's why the heart rate and the, the beeper alarm is so important because you just get this imperceptible increase in uh, intensity, degree of difficulty, and you shift out of that major fat burning mode and you start burning more and more and more sugar. And that's a completely different metabolic effect of the workout. So for most people who are trying to build endurance, uh, be cardiovascularly healthy and have this be a centerpiece of their fitness program, best results come when you slow the heck down and keep that heart rate at 180 minus your age in beats per minute or anywhere below that. That's the aerobic zone, the fat burning zone. So anyone, how old you are, you're 180 minus 50, your aerobic maximum heart rate is 130 beats per minute. And most people, if they were to go out there and actually do this with an accurate heart rate monitor, uh, would be shocked at just how easy that pace is and there's a lot of accomplished, competent endurance athletes that can go and perform admirably at the half marathon running race or do a four hour bike ride and climb in the hills with the fastest people in their neighborhood. Uh, but you know, setting that beeper alarm can be a real eye opener because it's the, it's the status of your fat burning ability, how, how you can perform at that low heart rate. And so the wonderful thing about this mafetone uh, advocated training, we call it in primal endurance, the aerobic based training is that if you discipline yourself to keep that heart rate low and you allow your body to build without the interruption of breakdown, burnout, illness, and injury that comes from an overly stressful training program, what happens is you get stronger and stronger over time without those interruptions. So you just get a little better, a little better, a little better every week or what have you. And you'll find yourself at the same heart rate moving much more quickly. And so you can actually do a test. So the runners would go to the running track. You want to have the same venue every time and run eight laps at 130 heart rate in our example, the 50 year old, and then you time yourself. So if those two miles take you uh, 17 minutes and 41 seconds, because you're watching that alarm, you're not speeding up, you're just honoring the watch and trying to peg it right at 130 as best you can. It's gonna go 132, 129, 131, 128, 132. You know, you just try to hold a steady pace, excuse me, you'll hold a steady heart rate, 
means you're going to slow down toward the end, by the way, the last couple laps are going to be slower than the first couple, just because of attrition, right? And then you're going to record your time, and you go out there a month later, and then you're going to go for a 1659, and then a 1627, and then a 1548. And everything feels super, super comfortable, but you're getting faster. And it's a phenomenal way to improve. And this has been, this strategy has been proven by the leading endurance athlete in every endurance sport for the last 60 years, dating back to Arthur Lydiard in New Zealand and training the great runners that came to the Olympics and won gold medals, Peter Snell, and all, uh, all on down the line. And, you know, this has been exported across the world to Michael Phelps, the swimming, you know, doing these workouts that lasted five hours every day for a race that takes a minute and 52 seconds. But the, tr the phenomenal aerobic base allows an athlete to then, when it's time to speed up and put the gas pedal on and do a, a proper uh, race pace effort, there's so much strength and power and aerobic capacity that they can easily speed up and then move at world record pace for, you know, running the 10 K on the track or whatever the example is. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's just, it blew my mind when I came across that principles. So I remember reading um, Phil Maffetone's book about 10, 12 years, 10, 11 years ago, big book of endurance and racing. Uh, I did the math test um, back when I was like 30, one, 30, yeah, something like that. And uh, I scored an appalling 13 minute miles at the age of 30. I mean, I was so aerobically put bad, fit, uh, unfit. It was unbelievable. I had to walk down hills sometimes. I was so mm -hmm. poor. Actually, I, I decided to rock out my old heart rate monitor because I've been doing a bit of running over the last uh, four months, just going at it at a more intuitive pace. And generally it's just kind of recovery runs at a moderate pace in inverted commas. But I struggled to keep up with my aerobic zone, actually. I was quite pleased. I felt a bit smug at the end of it. I was, I, I was finding that my muscles were starting to tire before my heart, which was, I felt quite good about that, seeing as it used to be the other way around. You know, because people think that if you're running at your aerobic pace, it has to be slow. You know, and it's like an iceberg where you've got this huge base of aerobic speed underneath the water. And then when you need that anaerobic kick, it's the top of the iceberg. But it's a, it's a fascinating concept. And I think, you, you, I mean, listening to a lot of your primary endurance podcasts and generally whenever you're, you're talking, you are constantly reminding people that they, they have to stay within that zone in order to really see the results they want. Because harder doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go faster. Yeah, well said. And then not uh, just so we have a clear understanding, everyone listening, uh, once in a while, if you want to go out there and, and bust one, this can have a fantastic uh, adaptation effect. So if it is that Saturday where you're going to go and do the four-hour bike ride and try to ride through the, the steep hills uh, with the fastest riders in your town and your heart rate's going to be all over the place, perhaps, let's say, um, you finish. That's a huge workout, requires a lot of recovery time afterward where you might just be pedaling slowly on a stationary bike for several days after a peak performance session. Same with a race. You're going to do a big race and then you're going to recover and allow your body to rebuild. And that's how we get fitter. Uh, but we know what happens when someone tries to race too much or tries to push too hard. And you know who uh, really has known this for even longer uh, are the the bodybuilding world and how to grow huge muscles to get on stage and, and look good. They are tremendous experts at stress and rest balance. They're not in the gym lifting bicep curls with an exhausted sore bicep after they did their major sets the previous day. They're moving on to other body parts. They're eating a bunch of food. They're having down days and, and, and tapering and doing all these things. Uh, but the endurance community in general with that type A approach, they don't want to take a day off because they feel like they're going to lose some fitness in one of the sports and uh, all these notions that you know, we have to be consistent and it's great to be consistent in a certain context, but I think we mess up the context a lot when we talk about training, thinking that um, some, you know, big objective has to be met. That's usually formulated in our, in our mind rather than figuring out what's best for our body. And Peter's talking about his client coming in and feeling like crap that day. Okay. Today, you're going to have a restorative mobility, uh, regenerative training session. And guess what? We might do that the next six days in a row. 
if you're not reporting, you know, proper energy at rest and, and supple, loose muscles. I mean, muscle soreness is the great uh, sign that your muscles don't want to do whatever you've been doing to them. And you got to back off and uh, just wait it out and be patient. I think Graham O'Brien, you remember him, uh, the, the hour record holder from Scotland? He had a, a great training strategy where, you know, he'd get on his bike and um, he, he'd pedal as fast as he can trying to uh, prepare for the hour record. And then if he wasn't ready to do it, the, the next training session, he would just take it easy until he was ready to go hard again. We can all, I think, figure out right when we start a workout, what we have in the tank on that day. And then the rest of the time we're making excuses, fooling ourselves, pushing ourselves too hard, or perhaps uh, wimping out, like you mentioned a little bit, uh, where you know we really might feel better if we just got ourselves onto the mat and started doing some uh, easy foam rolling mobility drills or what have you. That's, that's where, I mean, we, we've spoke about this before and it goes across to everything. I think it translates to, to, to most things in life. Um, but that training to, I mean, the, the, putting the heart rate monitor on goes on, I think we were saying it when we were recording, weren't we, about um, instinct and you were saying like, you know, animals chasing a rabbit or something <laughs> like that and they have to do it. And that, but we've got the, the deeper thought to be able to, to not do that. But the heart rate, if you don't use a heart rate monitor, because I because I've used just just breathing before. And if I can't breathe through my nose, I'll I'll slow down or or whatever it is that I'm doing. But the good thing with the, the heart rate monitor, I think, is because you can even be feeling like you're having a great day. You're, you're feeling fantastic, but you go out for that run and you reach that threshold very quickly for for whatever reason. And then other mm -hmm. days you might not be feeling as good and think, oh, I can't be, I don't want to do it today. But actually, your body's telling you that you're okay or your heart rate monitor is telling you you're okay. So it, it's, it's one of those things like, cause people, like you said, it's difficult to be in, in that intuitive about it, unless you've done it for a living, you know, like you have, but it's difficult to be that intuitive about it. If you're just some, somebody who works in a, you know, works in a shop and just recreational activity. So it is a good thing to have um, as a, as a measure of exactly what your body's trying to tell you, I think. Yeah, it's essential. There's just, there's no way to do it with uh, sensing very well. Even a long time experienced athlete like myself, I've been using heart rate monitor for what did I say? That's 33 years ago, uh, but yeah. I'm still fool myself anytime. And it might be uh, the caffeine in your bloodstream that morning that's elevating your heart rate higher than you normally uh, see it. But guess what? That means your body's under that stress from the stimulant and you adjust your workout accordingly. So it's a really nice way to bring all your stress factors to the table and then dictate your workout accordingly. Yeah. So, so there's obviously effects that go with <clears throat> chronic overtraining or not listening to your body and thinking that uh, if I just push through, if I just push through and forgetting about all the load of responsibilities for work, family, the stresses and strains of the world. And we, before the, we started recording, you mentioned that you have a current interest in testosterone. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about that and how that applies to something that our listeners would be interested in as well. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Testosterone is, uh, known as the ultimate masculine hormone. A lot of times we associate it with aggression and, uh, and macho power and, uh, uh, you know, the, the mindset of uh, someone who's a little bit uh, overly hyped. Uh, but the research on testosterone really quantifies it as the social status hormone. So it's used for peak performance in whatever venue we're pursuing. And that includes uh, intellectual, like the, the chess masters were uh, shown in one study to have a higher testosterone level than the opponents that they beat. And so it allows you to, to focus and want to elevate your social status, which is the male's primary biological drive. We want to uh, solve problems, conquer our surrounding environment and elevate our status uh, within the group. And so if you think of this broader definition of testosterone, it's really important to keep you motivated and, and focused. And some of the stuff I talked about at the start, like having an athletic goal is a really healthy thing for a male who's built to uh, want to be a conqueror and, a, and a, an explorer and all the great things that uh, made us humans today. So there's so much uh, talk about this. Obviously, it's a hot 
uh, supplement category and there's hacks and tricks and uh, the hormone therapy is extremely popular these days. The, the rate of hormone replacement therapy is skyrocketing because the average male testosterone level across the world is going down at a really alarming rate. Um, research from both Europe and from America show that uh, the average male testosterone level is declining at a rate of 1% per year since the 1980s. And I'm talking about whatever age you are, not the average decline that we experience ourselves personally over our lifetime, but that the, the male, uh, the 40 year old male in 1986 had a testosterone that was however many years that go, 40% higher than the average male now. So this is a, this is a disaster. And a lot of people uh, point to the main reason is because we have higher uh, body mass index today than we did back in the 80s. So the average male around the world uh, is carrying a spare tire. And particularly when we talk about uh, the difference between just having a lot of body fat and especially having that belly fat, that visceral fat around the midsection, that can be especially destructive to your hormone health. And so that's really a big thing to think about is that we have to fight this belly fat battle valiantly as our highest priority uh, for the rest of our lives and whatever age group we're heading into. If you <laughs> maybe you're having belly fat at age 21 when you're in the fraternity drinking too many beers, that's fine. But usually this belly fat starts to show up uh, when we hit our uh, big 4-0 or the big 5-0 and we start to experience this decline. Uh, but this, this uh, status of poor metabolic health as evidenced by the belly fat is what's gonna trash your testosterone and cause this accelerated decline. Is there, is there been a, is there a, when, when uh, testosterone decreases, do other hormones increase? Is there, is, do they find that all hormones decrease or is there a kind of uh, uh, interplay? Yeah, you might've heard this concept of insulin resistance, which is probably the single most uh, prominent health problem in the modern world, right? It's just the, the long-term type two diabetes, obesity, uh, driven by insulin resistance. That's producing too much insulin over a lifetime. And then, uh, you're all kinds of bad things happening in the body. And this kind of goes hand in hand with resistance to the effects of other hormones. Leptin is one of them. That's the key hormone that regulates, um, satiety and fat storage versus fat burning. So you're all dysregulated with your appetite and fat storage hormones because you're producing too much insulin. And this can also lead to uh, androgenic hormone resistance. So you're not really utilizing the te whatever testosterone that you produce, and maybe you're not producing as much testosterone as you could be because of these largely uh, metabolic health problems, thanks to your uh, lousy diet, mostly. But with this MOFO mission that I'm promoting now, I have a, a series of 10 assignments. And so they address all aspects of high stressful, high-tech modern life and how you can right the ship and optimize these different uh, lifestyle uh, objectives to improve your hormone status. So one of them, of course, is cleaning up your diet, but we also have to talk about sleep. We also have to talk about your workout patterns in particular, uh, doing too much exercise, getting into those overly stressful chronic patterns that we talked about where your heart rate goes a little bit too high at every single workout you do. So now, your exercise program is just elevating the stress level in your life rather than being a stress reliever for all the stress that you have at your workplace. And that's kind of a fun way to, uh, I, have a, I have a supplement product called MOFO. It stands for Male Optimization Formula with Organs. Uh, but here in America, MOFO is an acronym for uh, something else that could indicate maybe in, maybe in UK also, since you guys are smiling. But if you want to be a MOFO for the rest of your life, uh, we got to get all these things right. And the, the animal organ supplement is a great thing because it nourishes the body at the cellular level and it gives the specific biodirectors coming from the animal organs, the reproductive organs of the animal, testicle, prostate is what you're consuming in this freeze dried form. Sounds kind of weird, but it's actually really a potent way to trigger natural increases in your own testosterone production. Uh, but as we know, we talked about a little bit off the recording, um, replacement therapy does the same thing. So you can go get an injection of testosterone. And typically what happens if you have these metabolic health problems and unhealthy lifestyle patterns is that testosterone is going to give you a very brief boost. 
And then it's going to eventually go to waste because your body is not metabolically capable of utilizing it. There's this concept called, or this process called aromatization, which is the conversion of testosterone into estrogen, exactly what we don't want. And you will, uh, if you have too much of this enzyme aromatase in your body, that's what you're going to do with the extra testosterone that you just paid for in injection form. So it, it, it necessitates a lifestyle approach, no matter who you are, even if you do turn to drug therapy, because, because it's so popular now, and you become convinced that you want to get that extra edge after you're trying really hard in your lifestyle. But for most people, there's so much room for improvement with the lifestyle factors that um, we know we, we got to get those dialed in first and sleep would be probably the first thing. And then when we wake up in the morning, then we can talk about all the other uh, diet, exercise, uh, relationships, all that kind of fun stuff. There's a I mean, hierarchy of recovery. I mean, I was just going to say, uh, Brad, there's so many, I've got a load of notes written down that we, of, of, of topics and areas to discuss with you. And um, there's no way we're going to get through them all today. <laughs> 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 it's like an encyclopedia. <laughs> we, we just... the first one done. What's the second one? <laughs> yeah. So I was going to say at some stage, if, 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 you're, if you're up for it, we'd love to have you back on to talk about some things in more, in more detail. But I know, obviously, sleep, you mentioned, is a massive, is a massive um, part of, of health for everyone, you know, male and female, no matter what age you are. Um, and I know you've talked a lot previously around um you know blue light and kind of circadian rhythms and 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 stuff like that i mean can we maybe touch on that today and how and how important sleep is and setting ourselves up for better sleep um you know i know it's a huge we could do a whole podcast on it i know but can you kind of maybe talk about some of your thinking and your big big take homes about that yeah thanks james well the thing that i usually uh experience here when i'm when i'm talking to people about it is everyone nods their head. Everyone has the knowledge base and the information of how important sleep is. We know how we don't want to have bright lights going on deep into the night or being looking at our screens deep into the night. And I haven't encountered too many people that are like, really, we shouldn't have bright lights or be doing emails until 11.30 PM? Uh, you know, so we have, this, we have this widespread acceptance. There's no controversy about sleep. Well, the anti-sleep crowd say that you, know, you should just take a nap in the afternoon and that's all you need. So uh, rather than get into more dispensation of facts that people already know, um, I, I'd love to leave the listener with uh, something a little uh, off, off track here that's interesting. Of course, you need to dial in your evening sleep. The best way to do that is to minimize artificial light and digital stimulation after dark, build in rituals that are away from screen entertainment in the final hour, uh, ideally two hours right? Walking your dog around the block. If you own a dog, you're obligated to do it. And if you're not, you're a lousy dog owner. Don't be a lousy dog owner. Get the dog out and honor something bigger than yourself and your own selfish needs to watch Netflix instead. That's my plug, That's my plug for the dog. Uh, but I'm also interested in focusing on the incredible necessity for the first time in the history of human. We need downtime from hyperconnectivity and the mobile device that is stimulating our brain nonstop. And I know you guys reported your, your age groups and I'm a little older than you guys, but I had the, the great privilege of living, let's see, probably half my life or somewhere thereabouts without those mobile devices and without even the internet for a lot of those times if we go back and think about it. Uh, and so I know what it's like to be sitting around in the backyard chatting with my dad about golf after the round instead of glued to the screen and watching how Tiger Woods uh, hit his shots because we have that on tape and we can study it and get more information after our golf round. And so these periods of downtime where we were away from technology, uh, boy, that has widespread uh, benefits to brain function, uh, emotional health, mental health, the ability to restore and rejuvenate and refocus. And so I think that's an area where um, could be a really great wake up call for people to start putting in more, putting more discipline into place to power down when appropriate, such as when you're emphasizing direct social interaction, especially now because we're deficient in direct social interaction, right? So the least you could do if you are <laughs> having your mask on and, and having a lunch with a, someone is, you know, stay, stay present. And so I'm really working hard on that myself because I think there's a lot of great benefits to technology. I'm not going to bad mouth it out of hand, but 
Um, there's some great work, uh, a book called Deep Work by Cal Newport, talking about how to really focus and do your best work. Um, he says, you know, the more power these devices offer, the more, uh, the higher requirement we have to exercise extreme discipline for us to be the ones in charge and how to use them uh, appropriately and for best results. A good example is, you know, I like to grab my phone and look up um, how many uh, shots are being dispensed on a daily basis in, in America for the vaccine. Oh, it's 1.2 million, whatever. I'm, I'm glad to know that. But when I pick this stupid thing up to, to look up the information I want, uh-oh, look at my screen. Look at all these missed text messages I have uh, during the podcast. And um, I'm going to react because, oh, that's an important one. And that's an important one. So I've gone from being the guy in charge who proactively wanted to obtain a fact to improve my life to someone who's reacting to all this stimulus and throwing me off what I was supposed to do. Um, so that's the part where, you know, stay in control, exercise your power to, to power down and have downtime. And then doing things like spending time in nature and just letting your brain uh, take in the natural surroundings. There's great research around that showing that it has an instant uh, reduction in stress hormone levels and provides a sense of well-being and actually changes your body chemistry within seconds or minutes once you immerse yourself into a nature environment and put your phone away. So I'd like to throw that into the mix along with the uh, objective to improve our evening sleep habits. There are two ones very Go on, James. Go on. I'm just going to say one of the one of the straightforward things that I know I've heard before and I've heard you talk about it is is just something very simple that can have an, an immediate impact on on our listeners and, and and everyone is just not having your phone in in the bedroom where you sleep you know charging it up in another room or keeping it plugged in downstairs or in the hall or something because so many people just have the phone right by the bed and you know, if they're struggling to sleep or whatever, if they get, you know, they roll over that, like you say, they pick the phone up and there's instant stimulation there and they get dragged down that rabbit hole of, of, uh, you know, scrolling, scrolling mindlessly and, and, and taking in all that light and all that information again. Mine's, um, mine, I haven't got a plug socket next to my bed. So mine's, I have to charge it up in my cupboard, my wardrobe. Which means when the alarm goes off, I have to get out of bed to go and switch the alarm off as well. So it's a win-win. Oh, good man. It's in the bedroom, win -win. but I can't get up nowhere near yep. it. And that works one. And what you said there, Brad, you said it on your podcast as well. I think you said it in a slightly different way, was because I, I have no notifications switched on on my phone, mm. as in no beeps, no buzzes, no nothing. If people want to get in touch with me, they can ring me and leave a, an answer phone message, and I'll get back to them if I miss the call. But if you are waiting for a call or a message, this is what you said, you get your phone out more because it's yeah. not buzzing and beeping. So you're like, have they, have they got in touch yet? Have they got... And it's just, it's re... It, it, so this is one of the things, because I was like, I'm dead clever, me. I've, I switch all notifications off, that's it, done. But it'll still get you. And it's... It, it's so the only way to not have it is to not have it with you. That's it. Um, There's a team of people who are paid very well, who are very intelligent, yes. who are designing that software to, it's like a newborn baby. They're, they're bre you know, they've been designed by nature to grab your attention. You know? <laughs> and, and it's the same with your phone. It, it just grabs your attention. It's designed that the updates they do make it more and more intrinsic yeah. to your life. And what did they say in the 60s? That, that, that we, would be, um, we would be liberated from a life of servitude. We'd be able to spend all our time in leisure because of technology. But really what it's done and what I see with my clients is that they are now at their desk at 8 a.m. They will still be checking text messages and emails at 10 p.m. Because that's the way of the homework balance that we have with the kind of Zoom environment. So it's a, it's a tough thing to fight. But if you can start making small changes, then I think you can see a big return. Yeah, well said, especially the part about small changes, because we have so much information at our fingertips and we can better ourselves as humans so quickly and easily and efficiently that I think we get overwhelmed. I'm raising my hand. I personally get overwhelmed. I'm listening to other podcasts about guys that are so badass on so many different levels. And I'm like, oh man, I'm, I'm not even fighting that battle very well right now. I'm, I'm too focused on these nine other things. And so you can kind of feel like diminished if you're not just dialed in with every single thing that the next expert is listing. So the tiny little changes 
and I reference my morning routine as my best uh, success story. I'm here uh, uh, four years plus now doing it every single day without interruption, without fail. And um, it just started as a tiny little thing where I was getting uh, stiff and sore after my sprint workouts that I do once a week. And I'd wake up the next morning and my calves, I couldn't, you know, I'd have to tiptoe around and it would take two or three days to, to clear that muscle soreness. And I realized, geez, you know, I don't do anything close to sprinting except for on my badass workout that I feel great and perform very well. And I'm, I'm smart about it. It's not something stupid, but it's like um, once a week is not quite enough to condition the muscles and get my hamstrings in the proper flexibility and resiliency. So that's when I started doing, you know, five, 10 minutes every morning of working those hamstrings and getting that core uh, firing so that I'd have a little bit better base to launch the sprint workouts from. And it just grows from there. But it's a little change is a lot of the experts say this too. John Asaraf, the author of Inner Size, a brain training expert, um, you know, do something so small and so ridiculously easy that you're going to scoff at it. And you maybe even tell a client, can you, can you lift a bloody kettlebell 10 times a day? Uh, that's it. Just 10 times. But guess what? 10 times 365, you know, that's a lot of weight and that's a lot of goblet squats or whatever your, you know, your, your entry point is to a different world of being the person in charge and person that has that discipline to exercise, even in a small way. Fantastic. Uh, Paul, were you going to say something there? Sorry. No, no. I was just. I thought you were going to say. I could see you itching. To speak. <laughs> There's so many questions. That's the thing. Right. That's number two. James, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I think we haven't even touched yet, um, Brad. Obviously, and I don't think probably probably we won't we won't get started on it now. Maybe we will try and see if we can tempt you back on again. But we haven't even touched yet on the kind of uh, you know. You, we've mentioned a few times the, the importance of uh, nutrition and diet, but we haven't sort of even touched on, you know, sort of ketogenic and kind of carnivore and the, the, the you know, the effect that sort of sugar and simple carbohydrates have on the body and, and that sort of stuff. But I know that's a massive, um, a massive area that you talk a lot about as well. So um, I don't think it's, I don't think we should get into that at this, at this, at this juncture right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's been absolutely fantastic uh, speaking to you so far. Um, and yeah, I mean, like I say, I've got a list of things I could talk to you all day about, but um, I won't push you too much, I don't think, at the moment. One thing everyone's going to be really interested in is, like, how do you manage to get around a golf course that quickly? <laughs> and, and still manage to hit the ball and get it in the right direction? How the hell do you do that? Yeah, there's this sport called speed golf. And if you haven't heard of it, boy, you got to take a little time on YouTube. Of course, it's, it doesn't take much time because we play the golf course very quickly. But instead of the uh, traditional notion of golf being this slow, boring sport, speed golf is an actual golf tournament where you count your strokes and you, you shoot the course, uh, but they also time you when you start. And so they add together your minutes and your strokes, and that's your speed golf total score. So for example, my best score on the professional circuit, I, I shot a 78 in 47 minutes uh, one day at the California championships, I got third. And so my speed golf score was 125 and the winner was 119 and second place was 121. And so it's a very strategic event. It's kind of like the biathlon in the winter Olympics where they're cross country skiing, yeah. shooting at a target. If they miss the target, they ski a penalty lap. And so you gotta be a fast skier, but when you get to that target, you can't miss either. Same with speed golf, where you wanna hit that ball straight. You wanna get the ball in the hole without wasting time in the sand trap. And you gotta move quickly through the course. So you have to shoot a good score and be on the move at all times. So it makes it into an actual athletic event that's really uh, a, a great challenge to kind of get in that Zen mode where you're just reacting to what's in front of you. You're not overly analytical like so many golfers suffer from. And I've been playing on that circuit for many years, but uh, I'd like to mention that Guinness World Record you talked about because it all started with a gentleman from the UK named Steve Jeffs. And I give him all the credit because I was fooling around on YouTube one day and here's this uh, beautiful uh, world record, Guinness World Record video from the actual Guinness website. And it says, fastest single hole of golf ever played. 
And I'd, I'd never heard of this thing before. Cause again, I'm talking about, we're playing 18 hole tournaments where we're kind of running at a, a tempo pace and trying to play the whole course. I've never seen anyone just do one hole. Uh, but this guy had an awesome video uh, on the Guinness World Record site. Uh, his family dogpiled him on the green when he broke the official Guinness World Record. And so it was just a single hole and they just time you. They don't care what strokes you take, but it, you got to get from the, the tee to the finish in the fastest time possible. And uh, it has to be 500 yard minimum length hole. You can't do it on some little dinky hole, obviously. So you have the standard of a 500 yard hole. So I saw that video, I was captivated because I love sprinting as you know, my other main training focus. And I trained and trained and trained. And I had this miracle uh, experience on the golf course where I actually got a birdie. I hit four perfect shots on a par five. So I sunk uh, the putt for a birdie four. I was only using one club, which helped me break the record because I didn't have to even take a bag or mess with any other clubs. I just hit a three wood every time. And it was a really fun, uh, you know, competitive pursuit for me that I like to talk about a lot because it was, it was really special. It had a lot of mi uh, components in place. I had to get 10 people to officially certify the record. So I had to rally my friends and family and even find some innocent bystanders that I hadn't met before so they could sign an affidavit that they didn't have a vested interest, but they witnessed me break the record. So it was this big deal with the Guinness standards. And my video is pretty funny if you look at it on bradkearns.com. Again, it's only a minute and 38 seconds that it takes to watch me play the hole. So it's not a big, not a big ask of your time to watch a golf video. So a couple of questions there, Brad. So you 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 birdied a par five using only a three wood, yeah? Is that what you said? Yeah, I was sprinting full speed and carrying just a three wood. So I hit a three wood, I hit another three wood, I chipped up onto the green with a three wood, and I sunk the putt with a three wood. And that was through a very methodical approach and analysis of, you know, this Steve Jeffs had the record before me. Uh, it's since been broken by a professional on the European PGA Tour. I'm going to go back and get it um, this year in Spain. So I have something to shoot for. Uh, but that was, you know, a lot of practice, many months of practice chipping and putting with the three wood. And the most interesting thing is like, you're allowed multiple attempts at the record. But I'm out there uh, running an all out 400 meters like in a track meet. Because if you want to break a record, um, you're, not, you're not jogging or pacing yourself. You're sprinting to the ball. You can barely see the ball through the tears in your eyes and, and your heaving chest. And you just have to swing and hope you hit the ball straight through a lot of practice. But uh, it was really an all or nothing shot because I, I realized the first time I attempted the record that uh, I hit better golf shots on the second try, but I was so much slower running that it was really the first try, you're either gonna do it or you're not. So talking about that competitive intensity and that pressure, and then having all my friends and family show up onto the golf course and everyone's looking at us like, what is this big group doing here with clipboards? And you know, there was, so I felt this pressure that I hadn't felt for decades since I was retired from racing on the pro circuit when I was a young guy. And it was really cool to like put myself on that stage going, it's now or never. I've trained for months for this single effort that's gonna take a minute 38 and then we're going to be all done and go home and have dinner. And, you know, to put yourself in, the, in that mix once in a while is super healthy and super exciting. And, you know, to, the fact that I succeeded was great, but I remember just, you know, teeing off and realizing, uh, you know, that I was so thankful for the opportunity to just attempt the record and to have my friends and family out there watching me, that even if I failed and whiffed on the ball and you know couldn't find it and everything was a big dud, it's okay because I probably was gonna try it again some other time. So not, not that people uh, need to get, become interested in speed golf, but I think that's, that the story that I like to tell is that excitement level and that challenge and that you know working through this little obscure uh, problem to, to get in the Guinness Book of Records is uh, it's something that's, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> and then just, one more question just so you so that when you've got your best finish and you score you shot was it 78 you said or 76 78 so was that on a par 72 course yeah this is a championship course a pretty tough course um and we you know we like to go over six thousand yards so it's a legit you know tournament effort and um what's interesting there is if you give me all day 
with a caddy and 14 clubs, because I'm only carrying five clubs. So I'm doing these in-between shots often where I have to just figure out a way to get it on the green, even though I don't have the right club. But if you give me all day and all the clubs, I'm not much better than 78. 78 is a good round for me. I'd be happy with that. And that's what the magic of the sport is, is that you get out of that overly analytical mindset and you just allow your natural athletic ability to take over where you run up to the green, you get your first look at a putt and rather than studying it for five minutes and looking at the different angles, your brain knows how to hit that ball and how hard to hit it and has the confidence to do it unless you get in your own way and start telling stories. And I know the golfers listening are nodding their heads right now because you can get so far into your head that you lose confidence in your ability to just naturally swing and whack the ball onto the green. And in speed golf, you don't have time to lose confidence or you don't have time to get angry at a bad shot because when you hit that ball in the trees, you're sprinting into the trees to go find it and whack it out and keep going like hunting or something you can't wait for the prey to sit there and just you know you just got to get there focus or something yeah that sounds to me like a great way to make golf less frustrating because i don't i've I've not really played courses and stuff but i used to hit a ball around when i was younger um i only had a five iron and i used to end up most of the time just throwing the after the ball because it was just because i just just throw it down the throw it down the field. So that sounds like a great way to make it less frustrating. I might even take that up. But that's incredible, <laughs> Brad, to, to, to think that you, you, so you went around a championship golf course in six over par and you did it in around like 45 yeah, 47. minutes. 47. 47 yeah. minutes. And it 47. would normally take, you know, three and a half hours, four hours to get around if you're playing, you know, at a normal pace in a four ball Easily. or something. So, Easily, I mean, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. At least you get a workout. Even if you don't play well, it's always a good day at speed golf for sure. Oh dear! That's amazing. I mean, that's what I love about listening to your podcast. I'm always like, "That sounds crazy, but it sounds brilliant." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, so we uh, won't keep you any longer, Brad, because I know you're busy and uh, you've made the time to talk to us. But it's absolutely we'll come back fantastic. and we could talk about diet next time. It'll be fun. I'd I'd love to be back. I appreciate what you guys that's are doing. Great. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's so good for our community to hear what you say because. Um, I, th- I think you say it very clearly, and I think there is a lot of things that people can take action on, because one of the big challenges that most people face, and we've discussed it already in this podcast, is that there is so much information out there, and it's very difficult to know which way to turn. Yeah. But I think the message is, if you start very small and just incrementally add volume or add intensity, or whatever it is, just like you did with your morning routine, before you know it, you create something pretty tough, but something you can repeat you know, that's so cool. yep. I love it. And also with the yeah. testosterone, is there's an interesting kind of linear um, a parallel, which is grip strength, which men of our generation have a lower grip strength than the previous generation. Yeah. Crazy, uh, those stats. V- very disturbing. Yeah, the, the average grip strength has gone down. Your grandpa was stronger than you. That's pretty funny to consider. Yeah. So we've got waistlines expanding, we've got grip strength decreasing, we've got testosterone decreasing, and there's kind of three major strands there. If you can get on top of it, get stronger, work on your diet, optimize your hormone balance through lifestyle, you know, you've got optimal health, well, on the way to it. Yep. Um, Thanks, health oddity guys. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, James, do you have anything else to say? No, just to thank Brad for a, a really interesting hour. And uh, yeah, it would be great to have you back on uh, to talk about diet another time. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely sort that out. But thanks so much for, uh, for spending your time with us today, Brad. It's been a pleasure. And Brad, um, uh, before I go to Peter, is, are you, uh, how do people find you? Uh, what, what, what's the best route to kind of find out more information about what you can do? Oh, you can look at bradkearns.com and find this videos I'm talking about and uh, subscribe to the Be Rad podcast. I love to uh, hear from listeners f- from across the world. It's so cool to get an email from the UK or from Sweden and think, gee, you know, I'm sitting here in my closet recording these shows and uh, people across the world are listening. That's what's so fun about and connecting with you guys the same. I'm so honored to be on your show and uh, talk across the pond and get the information out there. So yeah, go go find me at bradkearns.com. Say hi. Send a note. Fantastic. And Peter? Um, I haven't got anything to add, but I just wanted to ask Brad if he remembers Jerry Springer. I forgot about this. Because Paul's little round, round up there is like, it's like Paul's final thought. 
Because when I was listening, I, I re-listened to the last week's one just to like chop it up and stuff with Dan John. And you did that at the end and I'd forgotten that you'd like, you'd, you'd done that. I was listening and I was like, oh, it's Paul's final thought. So final I need to remind Paul everyone to, li- to keep, out, keep, an, keep an ear out. Yes, Go indeed. Jerry. Go Jerry. Go <laughs> yeah, Jerry, that's it. But we, like I say, we have a better quality guest on our show. Well, this, yeah. <laughs> right on. Yes, this is true. <laughs> Brilliant. So, uh, thank you very much, Brad. Pleasure having you. Uh, and you guys listening, uh, please subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can listen on YouTube. You can listen to all the major in, uh, providers. And you can also like us on Facebook or Instagram. But uh, next week, we've got more guests. Uh, so stay listening and we've got the Dan John one from last week which was fantastic so keep listening thanks a lot you've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Land Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre to get your regular fix of hype free health you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favourite podcasts you can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey Health Odyssey